People who survive terrible trauma in childhood are such miracles. And it's hard sometimes for me to read the letters that I receive from people who are working on their lives, even though by all accounts, their childhood trauma, when I read what actually happened to them, could have ruined their lives. But the trauma wounds show up sometimes, even in people who really have a transformation, it comes back as a haunting fear that all the safety and the material security in the world that we create around ourselves when we heal, that it won't be enough. There's this fear that it will get taken away. So my letter today is from a man who is one of those people. He built a great life after growing up scared every day. And now it's, it's, it's back, that feeling that everything's going to be lost. So I'm gonna share the letter I call him Mark. And he writes, hi, Anna. This is my second or third attempt at writing this letter. In short, I'm 29 years old. I moved out at 17 because my mother had a really bad drinking problem. My parents divorced when I was two and my sister was four, ironically because of my father's drinking problem. Living with my mother was difficult because of her drinking, but also her own mental health issues. She was a bit of a problem child and ran away a few times when she was little, which is very relevant to how I was raised. After my parents got divorced, we moved four hours away and lived with my grandmother and grandfather for a brief period. Then we moved about 30 minutes away from my grandparents out into the middle of nowhere. When my grandfather passed away and rent was getting too expensive for my mother, we moved into a cheaper apartment above a hair salon down the road from my grandmother. My mother put some of our stuff into a storage locker. My mother struggled a lot and decided to go back to school, so we moved back into my grandmother's house. We also put the rest of our stuff into the storage locker. Things were tense between my mother and grandmother. They often fought like cats and dogs. One night, they got into an especially bad argument in the garage. I'm not too sure what was said between them, but I know it was bad. I personally don't trust my mother's retelling of it. But after my grandmother went to bed, my mother came in and woke me and my sister. She more or less said, if you love mommy, fill your backpack with clothes right now. If you don't, then stay here with grandma. Being a terrified little kid, I did what I was told and packed a bag. We then took off down the street in the dark. All of this happened before I was even seven. We ran off in the night and ended up staying at my mother's friend's apartment for a few weeks. My mother could no longer afford to keep the storage locker that had all our stuff. We were allowed to clear out what we wanted but couldn't afford a U-Haul and literally couldn't fit much in, into my mother's friend's car. So essentially all of our worldly possessions got auctioned off all our furniture, all our toys, all our photo albums, everything. We ended up moving to a nearby city where we all lived on a queen-size mattress on the floor of some guy's house. He had an arrangement with my mother where she'd be a live-in nanny. There wasn't any kind of nefarious intentions with this guy, at least not that I know of, though his children were kind of creepy towards my sister and me, and the guy's ex-wife was very mentally unstable. A very specific memory I have is when she put a brick in her purse and smashed through the living room window to get into the house. We had to call the cops and have her taken away. My mother made me and my sister help her with a paper route to make any kind of money. We would wake up at 5 a.m. with her and follow her with a wagon to deliver papers. Naturally, my mother pocketed all the money while my sister and I did a lot of the labor. I was maybe nine years old at the time. We eventually got kicked out and moved out to the middle of nowhere to stay at one of my sister's friend's house. My sister's friend's parents eventually kicked us out after we overstayed our welcome. We ended up briefly living in a truck stop for about a week, living off whatever food the staff were willing to offer us. We ended up in a women's shelter and some horrible ladies, one of which hit me for breaking a rule I didn't know about. And then we finally ended up in an apartment again in a different town. We had absolutely nothing at this point and I slept on a pile of clothes in my empty bedroom. I remember the first night eating in that apartment. We all sat on the floor in the empty living room and pulled apart a grocery store rotisserie chicken with our hands. My grandmother passed away and the unresolved trauma with my grandmother seemingly devastated my mother, but she also got some inheritance money and a lot of household items. We then moved to the next city over because we got into a geared to income housing program, and I lived in the house until I moved out at 17. My mother's drinking got so bad that I came home to find her passed out at the base of the stairs. She'd obviously fallen and knocked herself out. There was blood on the carpet and dried blood on her face. She had clearly been there for a while. 
This wasn't the first time for her, but it was the, it was the last time for me. And my sister and I called the, an ambulance. But the next morning, I moved out. I wanted no contact with my mother right up to her sudden death in, uh, a couple years ago. Keep in mind, this is not an exhaustive list or even a list containing the worst things, but mostly just a timeline of us moving around a lot, since that is what I would like help with. <laughs> Clearly, this level of instability had an impact on me as a kid. In total, I went to eight different schools, and I lived in countless places. I have a whole host of my own mental health issues, mostly depression and anxiety, but I believe moving around so much is very heavily linked to my anxiety. Being in such an unpredictable environment as a kid, more or less, conditioned me to constantly be waiting for the rug to get pulled from under me. My mother is dead, and I haven't lived like that since I was 17. Things have been very stable since I moved out. I went to university, I got my license. I'm in a long-term relationship, I have a decent job. I don't have to worry about food and I have more money in the bank than all my peers, plus zero debt. <laughs> Truly, I'm doing well for myself, all things considered, but there's always this little voice in my head telling me that my life is just a house of cards and a simple breeze will send me right back to sleeping on a pile of clothes or living on a stranger's couch. It feels like I'm always waiting in attack mode and I can never truly relax or enjoy my life. I guess what I want to help with is how do I convince myself that this is all real and not going to implode on me? How do I move on and learn that I don't need to clutch my purse so tightly or that I can have things or that things aren't going to be like they were before? Ah, and that is from Mark. Mark, oh my gosh, I hear you, my brother. <laughs> Parental alcoholism is a bear, and it sounds like your mom also had, as you said, mental health stuff going on. And this is quite the chronicle of instability, and I believe you that this is just a fraction of what happened. Um, what you're talking about, there's a word for it, it's hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is a really common trauma reaction that uh, comes from having to grow up, being very vigilant that everything's about to be taken away and you don't know where you're going to be staying, you don't know if violence is going to break out, you don't know if there's going to be food, and so your nervous system gets primed to jump into action on a moment's notice. And so you have very accurately described what that's like when it just doesn't switch off. And I'm so proud of you, Mark. You know, not everybody who grows up like you did gets on the, the, uh, on the path like you have putting together a life to be in your 20s and not only to have good work and a stable long-term relationship, but to be out of debt and to be self-reflective, like you're amazing, you are a miracle. And I hope your sister is okay too. You didn't mention how all that turned out. It's a very big deal to grow up like you did. And you obviously have a lot of strength. There's a lot of resilience in there um, on your side, working towards it. And I'm really glad you got out at 17, too. That's a critical decision. We, you know, here in this community, we have so many people who, like, they couldn't leave that early. They stayed. They tried to help things. They got stuck. And the damage continues. You know, when we talk about childhood trauma, it doesn't just, like, the clock doesn't just stop at high school graduation. It, it just goes on and on and on. And the longer we stay in a traumatizing situation, the longer we're sort of um, going into, you know, in your case, hypervigilance, but in a lot of people, a lot of the maladaptations of like, you know, going into sort of a fantasy land of imagining that everything's okay when it's not okay, or getting into self-destructive behaviors themselves, like all of these are just totally normal for traumatized people. As somebody like you who kind of got into hypervigilance and um, for me it was more like, over-functioning and, um, and then, you know, a whole bunch of problems around relationships. I, compared to some of my other siblings, I, w I was lucky. <laughs> I was lucky because at least my coping mechanism puts money in the bank. At least my coping mechanism tends to keep you employed. And so, you know, on the scale of terrible consequences of trauma, at least some things have that upside. You were homeless a lot, and um, we don't talk about this enough. But the homelessness and the incredible poverty, I can just imagine what you had to eat or the stuff you, t nights you went hungry. We had a little bit of that my, you know, in my family too. And, and then we didn't, and then we did. And um, 
it, it, it's been years for me to stop over buying food. You know, I would just always have like a basement full of food, shelves full of food, way too much. And it's not even a conscious thought of like, oh, you know, we might starve to death. A little bit during the pande pandemic, maybe I was thinking, oh, we should have a stockpile. But that's not really it. <laughs> that's not really what it was. It was, it's just a, a hypervigilance that's always there worrying about having enough food. And it leads to like weirdness around food. So it's a lifetime of healing around some of these subtle signs. And if you end up finding some of your subtle stuff later in your life, don't even worry, hon. You're just like everybody. It's normal. It's a normal sign that you lived through terrible things as you have. But you have enough going for you that whatever it is that's coming up in this, like right now, it's this anxiety all the time that you're going to lose everything. Man, that is so rational considering what you went through. So your nervous system needs to be brought into present time. It's just still kind of reacting retroactively to what you went through. And, you know, we are so lucky that we're born in this day and age when finally there's knowledge and research and, um, you know, science around why do we do that? And people can stop psychologizing it. And so that's what I encourage you to do is read a little bit about the neurology of hypervigilance, that it's not all psychological. <laughs> and a lot of what you've been told is like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I got that too. You're trying to recreate your childhood or there's a lot of psychological reasoning around everything that happens. But when you hit a wall and you're healing, like, you know, that, you know, you're being kind of intense about worrying that everything's going to be taken away. You know, it's not right, but you can't stop when, when you're, whenever any trauma symptom is like that, where you're doing the rational things, you're talking to yourself, you're maybe availing yourself of books and therapy but it doesn't budget, it's probably neurological. It's probably how you're, you know, the pattern that you've gone into. And neurology is a mysterious <laughs> void, right? We can't really see what's going on inside our brain and nervous system, but there are a lot of times when we can feel what's going on in there. And so the feeling of peace and confidence is a feeling that you can recognize. And so I encourage you to test out some of the things that other people have tried to calm their nervous system. And there are somatic methods of really focusing on the body. There are um, more cognitive type things like cognitive behavior therapy and talk therapy, if that works for you. Somebody like me, like the minute I'm talking about trauma, it tends to dysregulate me. So it's a really hard way for me to process those problems. But writing works for me. That's why I'm always here talking about my written technique of the daily practice. If you want to take that, it's always linked down in the description section below all my videos. So you could take that. And that is a nervous system calming technique, dealing with the anxious thoughts and emotions, you know, naming them, just going, whatever's coming up right now, you name it, you write it. And then there's a process of release. That's very specific. I encourage everyone to take the course. Um, cause you get very different results. If you just sort of try to wing it based on what I'm saying in a video, it's, a, there's a course, there's a PDF, there's a whole bunch of FAQs. And one of the most important things you can do, I don't know where you are with this, but physical exercise, is using your body and exercising outdoors if you can, even if the weather's bad, but letting your nervous system be out there moving around, interacting with the environment. Nature is nice, but so is an urban setting. Like nature's extra nice, <laughs> but just being outside, seeing the sun. And um, when you're, if you're walking, taking a brisk walk or even running, if you can, your whole nervous system is interacting with like space, surfaces, balance. And it loves that. It wants, to, it wants to be given a little run. <laughs> it wants to be given a little exercise. And it's a good way that you can reset your nervous system. So that's my hypothesis. You're in hypervigilance. Most other things are working well and your nervous system needs your attention right now. So there's a lot of great providers out there and courses and programs that you can do, you know, definitely come into my program. I have a lot of stuff that's self healing, but they're also there are also um, experts who know about this, both online and in person. And I would just encourage you, practically every therapist says they deal with PTSD and trauma, but you need to ask more specific questions and ask them, what do you do about hypervigilance? Or what do you know about trauma? And what do you know about some of the researchers and the thought leaders around hypervigilance who do that? The, the, um, the, the experts who know about the neurobiology of trauma and what happens to the nervous system there. So be your own best advocate. Don't beat yourself up about this. 
um, if you have any idea that you're broken or hopeless, like just let that go. You know, it's coming from me to you. You're not broken at all. You have a common symptom. A lot of people get stuck like that. There's healing that you can do to move that forward. And then everything gets easier when your nervous system is kind of working with you rather than kind of clunking along with a flat tire, like, like a lot of us after childhood trauma, a lot gets easier. Your health gets better. Your ability to focus gets better. And just that sense of peace and calm. And if you want to come in and try my daily practice, please do. I, you know, we, there's a free course. Anybody can take it. And then every two weeks I lead a free zoom call. Hundreds of people come. We do the techniques together. I take questions. Um, you know, this is a place where a lot of people are working on the feelings and, um, and thoughts that go with trauma that are very noisy in the head for some of us. And then we get some calm around that. So a lot of the fear of, you know, losing everything that you have, resentment about what has happened. I hope that makes sense to you. A lot of people, they hear fear and resentment and they're like, no, but this is reasonable. And I agree with you. It's totally reasonable, but the feeling is looping. The feeling and the thought is looping and it's still affecting you and still sort of directing your actions as if it's still going on. And so there needs to be a way to sort of relax the hold of that thought. You don't have to go into denial about it, but just unloop it. <laughs> um, EMDR is another therapy that people use to stop looping. And I've had tremendous success with it on some stuff. It, you know, ac according to research, it's more effective for adult onset traumas than child traumas, but it's always worth a try. I prefer EMDR done by practitioners who don't require a lot of talking about it. It's actually possible to do the EMDR where they're just sort of saying, okay, are you thinking about the troubling memory? And you can say, yeah, okay, now do this. <laughs> and you don't have to tell them the troubling memory. Like that for me, for somebody like me who gets re, um, re dysregulated because of talking about troubling memories, that is so much better. So different people are different. And that's why you must be, you know, the person who leads this, you're sovereign over your healing and then consulting with people. And you consulted with me by sending in this letter. And thank you, I'm honored by the question. And I hope the answer has been helpful to people. Hypervigilance is, is tough and it takes a number of forms too. Um, and I think hypervigilance takes um, an emotional form sometimes that people are gonna leave all the time. And that's a brutal one. That's very hard on relationships. So um, I wish you well with that. Uh, to direct your attention to how good things can be when you're a more free of trauma, I'm gonna leave you with this free download called Signs of Healing. This is the, some of the signs that you will notice are happening when you're healing. And Mark, I know you're already showing a lot of these. Uh, you can download that right here, and I will see you very soon. Mm -hmm.